Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for being with us, whether here in person or tuning in online. In today's STC Tech Talk, we are going to discuss the rising threat of cybercrime. Before I proceed, I'd like to invite the CEO of STC Bahrain, Engineer Rizar Benabila, to stage to open this panel. Please join us. Mm -hmm. 
السلام عليكم صباح الخير اصحاب السعاده دستنجو جست حياكم الله جميعا اس سي سي توك ان شاء الله فروم تكنولوجي برسبكتيف وي ويلكم اول اوف يو ويز اس هير توداي اوف كورس وي ار سو براود باي هافينج اول اوف يو ويز اس تو هير فيس اون فيس اند اكشولي ان ذس لوفلي كانتري بحرين which is the country that has a clear agenda for 2030. And one of the fundamental things that has it in its agenda, which is the ICT development. As you know, one of the main pillars for the ICT development, which we going through the digital transformation, an essential part of the digital transformation, the cyber security. Today, we feel so proud by having this great panel, that has the expert in the whole of the region who would come and talk to you and talk with you and enlighten all of us of what we have for cybersecurity. So again, I'm welcoming everyone. And please, we will have this today as an open discussion, open platform. Thank you so much for being with us here today. My name is Omar Kandil. I'm, I'll be moderating this panel today. Our panel will be divided into five different sessions, where in each session we're going to discuss uh, one different topic. Uh, our esteemed speakers will get to answer uh, one question in each topic, and then we're going to take a couple of questions from the audience before we move to the next topic. <laughs> the internet has not only become central, but critical to almost all of our lives. We are connected on social networks. We use multiple platforms and applications and we are continuously sharing our personal information online. Some of us even use the same password across several platforms and applications. This reliance results in increased cyber risk and makes our personal data far more vulnerable than it was ever before. Everyone today should be more aware of the cybersecurity threats facing us. How can we protect ourselves as individuals and what measures should we take while engaging on the internet? In the first session, we are going to discuss cybersecurity threats, what should we know, and how can we protect ourselves. My first question is to His Excellency Sheikh Salman Al Khalifa. Thank you for being with us. You are the CEO of NCSC, which is the National Cybersecurity Center, with more than 20 years of experience in central information organization. Sheikh Salman, Twitter recently paid $7 million to Peter Zatko, a whistleblower who was fired from Twitter uh, as the position of head of security. The amount paid was to ensure his silence on Twitter's possibly misleading statements about their ability to defend against hackers and spam accounts. What should the government's role be in this case? And should governments apply cybersecurity regulations to protect the users? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Yes. So I think um, government does play a major Can role. Can you bring it? Hello? Yes, perfect. So I, th I believe government does play a major role in ensuring that information is protected. As we all know, um, cybersecurity has been an afterthought in many organizations, but uh, the need to bring cybersecurity up forward to the board and replace that profit first mentality needs to change. And the only way you can do that is through regulation. And I think having the government put in the right regulations, the right standards in place ensures that cybersecurity is put at the front of the table at the board level, giving it the, um, the right financial backing, ensuring that it is, um, they are accountable and responsible for cybersecurity. Uh, we've seen European Union, for example, put in the GDPR. Mm -hmm. Now, this is meant to a, ensure that the citizens' data is protected, that security practices are met, and the way data is handled needs to be handled in the right, right manner. We've also seen ENISA put in the right cybersecurity standards for cybersecurity products. All these standards and regulations are there for one purpose only, is to protect customer information and citizen information. And that has elevated the European Union above all uh, nations uh, in its efforts to protect citizens. Mm -hmm. We've seen that on the ground. And we've seen, for example, Singapore put in very high regulations to the banking sector, just to protect and ensure that their citizens are protected. That's amazing. Thank you so much for your input. 
My next question is to Mr. Fahad Al Jutaili. Mr. Fahad, you are the CEO of CIRAR by STC. You are a visionary technologist with more than 20 years of experience in cybersecurity. May I ask you what are the most serious cybersecurity threats that businesses and individuals face today? طيب, uh, thank you very much, Omar. Uh, first of all, allow me uh, really to uh, uh, to say Allah yatikum al fafia. Shukran al hadurukum. Really, it's uh, it's an honor uh, to be uh, for me to be here among the great panelists. It's an obliger to meet with uh, with the leaders and the executive in, uh, in the Bahrain market uh, who is leading and handling the different sectors and industry. And uh, would like to thank uh, Mr. Nizar for this, uh, this invite. That is a uh, great uh, thing for us really to be among, uh, among you. Now, uh, back to the question, uh, Umar. Uh, really always, uh, you know, I put in the corner myself when we start with uh, such type of question because it comes with the fear, uh, really. But uh, the good thing through this panel uh, discussion, we will start with, uh, with, the, with the bad news, let's say, and then we will, uh, we will end with the, with the great news. Now, if we will look to, to the cybersecurity, uh, globally, by numbers, uh, last year, 2021, the cyber crime was, was accounted for six trillion uh, US dollar. And that is a huge number, and really is compared to the third uh, position in, in the global uh, countries' GDPs. So it's a mess of things that is happening because of uh, the cyber crime. Now, uh, back to the question where uh, where we are talking about the risks and threats that the individuals and organizations facing. Now, if we will talk about the individuals, um, the most, uh, I would say, threats that they are facing today, the individual is related to the social engineering. <coughs> there is a, a long list that they are facing, but the major one is the, so the, social, uh, the social engineering. The social engineering is a technique that is being used by the bad guys to reach to the individual, to steal, to manipulate, and to play with them in, in the domain of, uh, of their data and their privacy and so on. And uh, for sure, the objectives always, when they are targeting the individuals, is different from, from one place to another place. Mm -hmm. And m majority of it is related to the financial things. Or it could be used to penetrate more in, in, uh, in their uh, areas and, and domains. Now, when we are talking about the social engineering, there is now tools, different tools that is being used by the cyber uh, uh, attackers, I would say, like, you know, the phishing. Phishing yeah. is one of uh, the most tools that is being used to reach to the individuals uh, to manipulate them. And now we start seeing even more uh, which is the new concept that we start hearing about, which is the smishing. Smishing, which is the SMS phishing, where they can reach to, to the individual through the SMS. And also through the calls, through the communication. Always is, is through the communication. Now, that is a kind of a bad news. But what I have seen really in Bahrain, and that is, uh, that is a great thing, and it's a great indicator for where the country is, is going. I have seen the pillars that we have, uh, that Bahrain has in, in uh, the, the national cybersecurity strategy is, uh, is the awareness and raising the awareness. And I think that it will play a major role uh, in, in the near future to raise the awareness of the individual to reach to a better maturity. And at the end, it will lead for more resilience environment and country. Now, when we are talking about the organization, the organization for sure, they are facing a huge amount of uh, threats and risks. But I will, I will summarize it in three. The first one, which is uh, the ransomware. The ransomware is one of the easiest and the most impactful attack that could happen to any organization. Uh, God forbidden, we hope nothing to happen to anyone, but, but it is the tool that is being used today. The, the objective of, to, of to use such type of attacks to the organization is to steal information. And this is what, where, where it's been advanced now, and also the financial things. Mm -hmm. One thing is to mention here that is related to it. The bad side of the cyber world is, is growing exponentially. 
They are very advanced. They are using the most advanced techniques, not just in the technology side, but even in the economic side. They were one of the first adapter for the cryptocurrency. So the cryptocurrency, it become the tool for them to ease their work when they are uh, initiating the ransomware attack. So, and the ransomware attack, as with the, the statistics, it's happening in, in every 11 seconds. Before like three years, it was in, in, in each 40 seconds, but now it's mm -hmm. happening in, in, in each 11 seconds. As, as what we are speaking now, there is organization globally that is under attack because of, because because of, of uh, the ransomware. Now, uh, the second thing, which is also it's an easy thing that is happening, the denial, uh, denial of uh, service attack or distributed denial of service attack, it's nothing. It's being provided, as I mentioned. They start applying the economic models in their business uh, models, uh, uh, those, those guys. Now, they are offering these attacks as a service. So the ransomware is a, uh, as a service. So it's a shared economic where they deliver it to a service for you or for the bad guys and they initiate uh, the attacks and they, then they will share the, the revenues uh, out of that. So the DDoS is one also of the techniques that is with a few hundred of dollars, it can be initiated to any organization and it will do a massive uh, disruption. The third one that I can uh, close yes, with please. is related to the phishing. The phishing is n tool number one when they are targeting any organization because that will be through the emails and we know the email is the tool that we are using it in our daily, uh, daily life and in our operation and running uh, the business. And it's easy uh, to penetrate to the organization if uh, the level of resilience is not up to the level in the organization and that will be the, the big impact. So this is what I start with which is the bad things, but with, with our discussion, inshallah, we will Thank clarify so more much. for the capability that we are bringing to the markets where we can support, enable, and uh, also amazing. help the businesses. Thank you, Mr. Fahad. Mr. Haider Pasha, you are the Chief Internet Security Officer of Palo Alto. You are a highly motivated and trusted global business executive with sales, tech, and managed, management experience. Cybersecurity is no longer just a topic of interest for tech gurus and IT personnel. Consumers like us are more affected than ever by cyber threats. As a cybersecurity service provider, you have a great responsibility to protect the users. What are the basics of cybersecurity when it comes to individuals, and what advice can you share with all of us today? First of all, thank you very much for the invitation um, to be here. It's an honor for me to be on this panel and to meet our esteemed uh, audience as well. It's a pleasure having you with us. Thank you. Um, so as you rightly said, it, 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 is, a, it is a growing challenge. Um, I think uh, as, as individuals specifically, um, I think uh, there's a lot that we have to continue to educate ourselves on. Um, I would classify it under three areas here. So the first is the devices that we use. Now, for many of us in this room, you know, we've been using technology for pretty much most of our lives, right? And especially if you look back in the last 20, 30 years, um, technology has really evolved. So now we have smartphones, we have smart TVs, we have smart devices in our homes. You know, how well are we protecting those devices is always the question. So um, for me, a device isn't just your laptop anymore. It's not just your, your, your mobile phone or your tablet. For me, it's everything that has an IP address in your mm -hmm. home. How well are you protecting it? How, what kind of, um, you know, are you changing default usernames and passwords, as an example? You know, how well are you protecting your home routers, as an mm -hmm. example? You know, so th there, all of these are now entry points into our lives that we need to now look at. And um, that's a critical area that I think uh, people need yeah. to understand, that it's not just about your, your laptop anymore, it's about all the devices. Now, you know, I can sit here and, and talk about, which I'm sure everyone in this room must have heard, all the basics of cyber hygiene, right? So as we have physical hygiene, where we're using sanitizers now and social distancing and everything else, yeah. we need to follow something similar for cyber hygiene. So what is it? Basic cyber hygiene is what you've been hearing all along. You know, making sure you have strong passwords, making sure you're patching your devices, making sure you're, you know, you're not clicking on things that you don't, uh, and you're not aware of. These are all basic commonsensical things that we need to be doing. But what I think we also need to do now is we need to also educate ourselves. Even if you do not have any background in cybersecurity, it doesn't mean that tomorrow when you hear of a new threat, when you hear of a new attack, when you hear about a new worm or a virus, that it, you don't take the, an extra five minutes to read 
that news article to really yeah. understand what's going on. You know, how did that happen? Uh, my colleague just mentioned fishing. I mean, fishing has evolved. You know, we're now seeing multifaceted levels of phishing, as he just mentioned. Someone will send you an SMS. If I'm truly targeting you, I can send you an SMS. I can get that detail. I can then, uh, in the SMS, mention that I will be sending you an email shortly. So in your mind, even though you may not know where the SMS is coming from, who the person is, you might think, okay, this is, you know, I'll just ignore it. But maybe an hour later, you see that email with a QR code. And so in the email it says, just click on the QR code, you'll go straight to your discount or your whatever you know, the email is saying. And then you use your phone to go into that mm -hmm. QR code. And obviously it takes you to a malicious website or some malware or something along those um, lines. Mr. Haider, what is the first red flag when it comes to phishing? When should you be aware? The, the first red flag, I think, for anyone is if, I, if somebody's sending you email that you don't know, if you don't know who that person is, uh, the, you should question it, mm -hmm. right? So, and, and especially if that email is asking you to, uh, there's an urgency inside of that email. Click on this or, you know, don't lose your chance to do yeah. X, Y, Z, right? These are, these are tactics that those attackers use to basically lure you into clicking into or clicking moving something. into that. So, uh, you know, we talked about, so this is really part of the behavior that we need to change. So we, I talked about devices, I talked about behavior. And the last thing I'll close with is what we do online. So online, I think our behavior and obviously the devices need to reflect in as well. So yes, we all have social media accounts. What you share on social media needs to be looked at. Um, I recently heard of somebody getting their house uh, uh, robbed because they went online and said that I'm on holiday for one month. <laughs> and so the attacker saw that and basically went to their house and then they, they, you know, they got robbed. But simple things like sharing personal information. You know, we have, I'm sure many of us in this room have children. I have a seven-year-old son. I have an 11-year-old daughter. They are on the metaverse faster than I, I, I could ever be. And so educating them on that, trying to explain to them that they should not be sharing personal information. Even the country they live in, you know, should not be shared at this point, right? These are all kind of behavioral things that we need to change with obviously making sure our online presence is uh, That's active. amazing. Thank you so much. Sure. Mr. Jat Haj, thank you for being with us. You are the partner and vice president at Strategy and Middle East. You have more than 15 years of experience in telecom and ICT. A TikTok breach compromised 2 billion user records. Samsung fell victim to theft of US customer records. And major applications are facing continuous cyber attacks. How should users react to such breaches? And what can we do to protect our own data? Let me first start also by thanking everyone for being here and thank you STC for inviting us and my fellow panelists. Uh, Omar, to your question, maybe repeating a little bit what, uh, what uh, Haider mentioned, uh, a big percentage of cyber attacks are triggered by human errors. We tend to underestimate you know, the, the, the need to be uh, cautious when it comes to uh, our uh, usage of uh, applications, of devices, and what have you. And a lot of what I'm going to say is, is common sense, really. But we tend to forget it, uh, as I said. So one, you know, the strong password. Uh, we've all heard this. We tend to ignore it. We got, get used to a password. We use it all over uh, across different uh, applications or mm -hmm. devices. This is crucial. Two is uh, the double factor authentication. A lot of your apps nowadays uh, ask you if you want to increase security. Uh, you know, put your, your email ID or your uh, mobile phone so that you can have two-factor authentication. So not only the password, but another means to authenticate you as an end user. Three, another thing, and I am a big culprit of this because I travel uh, a lot, is the use of public Wi-Fi. A lot of us, you know, are at the airport, the coffee shop, we tend to trust whatever network is available. And sometimes these networks are vulnerable, yeah. they're uh, you know, uh, prone for attack, so just be careful. Use a VPN if you're forced to uh, use a public Wi-Fi. It's an uh, easy tool to, 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 to add and uh, you know, makes sense to protect yourself. On, uh, on what also Haider mentioned regarding uh, you know, social media and what to share, keep as much as possible. Again, I know this is a trend. Maybe people at our age are a bit more careful. The younger generation is, is not so careful. So that requires a little bit of education, awareness, back to uh, what, what Fahad also mentioned. Very important that you're careful on what you're sharing uh, openly. Uh, there are settings in all of these social media apps and, and tools where you can make parts of your account private, right? Again, I don't know how, how many of you have kids and have checked 
uh, these settings. Uh, I have a son who's 10 years old, big on PS4. If you go into the settings of the PS4 or PS5 or the you know, PlayStation in general, you find out there are, there are so many micro settings that you can toggle on Might and off go. that would really help protect while maintaining the, you know, the experience of the gaming. You don't want to also kill the, the, the experience, but a lot of it is uh, controllable and can really help protect the identity, the privacy of the end user. So a lot of small things. I think a lot of what I said, again, is common sense. It's not something that we don't know. We tend to ignore, and that's creating a lot of uh, vulnerabilities in the, in the ecosystem, in the system. And again, a big percentage, I think statistically, 90% of the uh, threats are triggered by human errors. So uh, vulnerabilities that people could have avoided. Uh, and that's a big percentage. That's amazing. All right, before we proceed to our next session, we'd like to take a question from the audience. So if someone, sure. Uh, we just need a microphone, please. Hamel Qawad, CEO of Information and Government Authority. I would like to thank you, CC, for uh, this opportunity and all the great uh, panelists sharing their experience. Thank you. Uh, you addressed mostly about, you know, the attacking, phishing, you know, the things that uh, protects us from somebody who's trying to, to uh, get information or uh, uh, maybe a denial of service or attacking somebody. Uh, what about the side of easily available data that somebody's, you know, behaving normal and, you know, uh, giving the data. What should be done against those data? For example, when you go for money exchange, they ask you for the card and they get a copy of it. When you go, uh, 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 you know, for example, using benefit, they get your numbers. Uh, WhatsApp, they have all their cal your calendar. Many other applications, they have your data there. And somebody might have access to those data and then uh, doing something. Uh, with those data. Mm -hmm. That's a brilliant question. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jad, would you like to address it, please? You know, maybe there are two elements of this. There is the regulatory, and maybe I'll, I'll leave this to, uh, to Sheikh Salman to address, but more from an end user perspective. Uh, again, it's about what, what you share. And, and in many cases, you can either uh, opt out from sharing that much. We tend to overshare. Right. Um, they ask you to fill the bare minimum, you fill the entire form, uh, be it an application, be it a, a, you know, a request or what have you. So where possible, opt out. Two, again, if it's something that's within your control, so your own device, make sure that the means of communication is secure, the network, the device itself. I know you cannot control uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, application itself and, and what the data is, uh, w you know, what's going on with the data. This is, again, where the regulatory part will come in uh, and, and, you know, hopefully there will be more and more regulation that will force uh, companies, force, uh, uh, you know, service providers to ensure that your data is encrypted, you know, that your data is protected, that your data is uh, kept private and not shared. Another important uh, uh, element that we also tend to forget when it comes to identity theft is leaving paper trail. Many of us focus so much on digital that we believe, you know, cyber attacks are triggered by data that we provide online or through a digital mean. Some of the attacks are also actually uh, triggered because you've left a paper trail, right? A bank statement, a, uh, a water uh, bill, uh, you know, a credit card statement, and Cyber attackers could stitch all of this together, augment it, and add to it, you know, what they know about your online or, or uh, digital ID, and then uh, initiate an attack. So be also careful not, about, not only about your digital uh, identity and your digital experience, also the physical aspect is, is important. Maybe I will turn the question to Sheikh Salman from a regulatory and compliance point of view. Thank you. Um, but Ali, as, as you rightly said, it's a, it's a very important area. Uh, GDPR in, the, in Europe and obviously data privacy in the Kingdom of Bahrain is the key to resolving that. Um, many companies go out and sell your data. Um, they manipulate your data. 
and not follow best practices to protect your information. And that ends up in the, as open source intelligence about an individual. So the key to resolving that is having the right laws in place and having the right procedure to ensure that these companies are adhering to it. You take, for example, if you go to Apple in the US, if you go and have already bought something from them, your information is already there. But go to Apple in Europe, and you'll end up having to put the information multiple times. And that is all because that they saw that the risk is too high, their compliance is going to be complicated, they have to show compliance, and hence they decided not to store your information. So the law the and audits on that will help a lot. Just a single comment on that. Sure. Uh, as you rightly said, it's different between you know, the US and Europe, and I, I found it, for example, if you browse here, CNN, BBC, or you know, any of the airlines, uh, and the website that asks you about the uh, cookies. Yeah. Okay. Here, sometimes ask you, doesn't ask you, and they keep all the, the, all the permission in Europe, keep asking. Okay, if you say, don't share it, Sometimes it doesn't open. So That's true. you are forced. You cannot book a flight or do anything because without sharing you are, you are forced to do it. Or you make it to the minimum. Just after a minute, they ask you for the same thing. So they annoy you that is correct. 100 times until you just, you know, uh, fed up and give them the full access, which ends up to the yeah. same situation that we have here. Unfortunately, anyway, with all the laws, still there is a gap. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Amr, if you allow me, I would like to, uh, to add uh, to what uh, Sheikh Salman uh, mentioned and also Jad. Maybe I will uh, take it from another angle and always really um, we are insisting on this, especially when we are talking about you know, the cyber security and the data privacy and so on. Uh, it is not a responsibility of one entity to take care of that and they will be accountable and responsible for that. Everyone is sharing part of that responsibility and accountability. When it will come to, to the individual level, uh, the awareness, and this is always what we are mentioning. We know the cybersecurity domain, and you know the data is something new to the market, something new to the whole world. And the people, they start just getting mature on that. So raising the awareness of how critical sharing such type of information is for them, for their life, and, and so on. If we look to, to the other side of it, absolutely, everyone will, will, will try to fly, you know, and you know, run behind these, uh, these data. From a, a regulatory point of view, they will, they will do all what's required to make sure. And uh, from the provider side, they will do whatever is required from a control point of view to do where, we are, where you are dealing with a trusted people or trusted entities. But still, there is, other entities that is looking for this information. This information we know. The personal information today, the record, the one record that is being sold in, in, in the dark, dark web, I would say for one, uh, $3. And from the other side, other entities, they are monetizing these data and they are getting a huge revenues if you will compare it to other, uh, other organization that, or other uh, companies that is creating more products. The bottom line here, the point that always we are insisting on is um, back to the individual themselves. They need to reach to a level of uh, 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 knowledge where they need to, uh, the first um, uh, uh, level of defense for themselves, for their data. For in our organization, always we, we run a program for you know, enterprise risk management where you identify the risk and then you start either to accept or uh, uh, mitigate or transfer this risk. This, it will go to, to the individual. When he's dealing to share his data, he need to size this risk. Is he dealing with a trusted? Is this under a, a certain regulation? Or no, it's not trusted and so on. And then he need to assess this risk if he is accepting it and then sharing the information or not, or he can find the other uh, uh, alternatives uh, for, yep. for his data. Thank you for your valuable input, Mr. Fad. Uh, we now need to start with our next session. Uh, we're, we're going to discuss digital transformation and the role of MSSPs. Businesses are going digital, and we can see that most companies have their data online. Employees are able to access this data from the work, workplace, but also while working remotely from home. Employees might be using vulnerable networks, which could, could put the company's security at risk. In this session, we're going to learn more about the different threats 
and how MSSPs can protect these companies. Mr. Jad, an MSSP is a managed security service provider, which is a third party company offering cybersecurity services to companies. Can you please walk us through on ho how organizations can gain value by adopting an MSSP partner? Sure. So, again, over the past years, uh, you know, the awareness on cybersecurity has, has increased. Uh, significantly globally. Big push from governments, from regulators to adopt uh, cybersecurity. A lot of the smaller companies cannot afford to have a, you know, an in-house mm -hmm. cybersecurity team that does everything from incident detection to remediation. And uh, there was a, a, you know, an opportunity for security service providers to come and address this. So providing cybersecurity services as a service, uh, meaning you subscribe to with a service provider, you opt in, and the service provider offers you end-to-end, -end, all the way from advisory services, uh, compliance services, risk management, auditing, cyber security uh, in terms of uh, review and in terms of enforcement across the board on a paid model, so it's typically a monthly or a yearly recurring fee. And this is typically tailored, again, for companies that would want to outsource their cyber needs to external entities, to, to service providers. The power of MSSPs lies in a, couple of, uh, in a couple of areas. One, they tend to have scale. So they serve numerous customers, hundreds, thousands of customers across different industries. And that benefits them from a learning. They learn, you know, what is the trend, what incidents are taking place, and hence they can secure, you know, their customers. Two, with scale comes the ability to invest. So when you are serving, again, thousands of customers, you can invest in top-notch talent, and talent is a major element of having proper cybersecurity. It's actually the scarcest resource nowadays. Uh, and again, I, I'm sure my panelists will, will, uh, will clarify this. So when you're operating at scale, you can invest in talent, you can invest in technology infrastructure. So instead of uh, having to, again, as a company, invest on your own on an infrastructure, be it on uh, you know, hardware or software, as a service provider, you can invest and use it across thousands of customers. You can invest in uh, 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 you know, the latest processes, procedures, policies to make sure also that you offer these as a service to your customers. So MSSPs are, again, service providers that offer security as a service, typically tailored for uh, smaller size cu customers. So here typically we're talking about large and SME segment that do not or cannot have in-house cybersecurity capabilities and prefer to opt in uh, with a service provider. Uh, offers a lot of benefits. Again, these guys are experts and they do it for a living. So this will allow you as an SME or as a business to focus on what matters most to you. Mm -hmm. If you are a, a retail company, you focus on your core business. If you're a, uh, uh, you know, entertainment or what have you, you don't have to worry about cybersecurity. You're basically offloading all of this to an MSSP. Thank you so much. To elaborate on this question, Mr. Fahd, large enterprises are investing a lot in cybersecurity, while we can see that in small and medium enterprises, cybersecurity is not uh, addressed properly, and in some cases, they are falling short. What are the main reasons why cybersecurity is still an underestimated topic in SMEs, and how can MSSPs provide uh, the security that they need? Yeah, uh, I would say, uh, and I believe, uh, really the reason for that is uh, is the assumption. The assumptions that they will not be targeted mm -hmm. and in comparing to large enterprises. Um, and that is not true. Now, if we are, again, we are talking about numbers. As Beer MasterCard, uh, uh, they have uh, uh, shared an information that is related to this, where they are saying that more than 60% of the SMEs, um, they faced at least one uh, incident in the past two years. And in the US itself, in the US market, 
50% uh, of uh, the SMEs, they are facing that tax on a daily basis. So uh, that kind of assumption is not true. We know this, uh, this segments and, and the market is, is facing challenge uh, in two things. Uh, the first thing, which is the resources, and especially when, to, when we are speaking about the financial resources, and the second one is the skills. So if you are not targeted, believe me, that you will be or could be on a, on a platform or a base to be initiating target uh, to be initiating attacks to others so if they will not harm you they will use you if you are vulnerable to initiate attacks to other organization or to even other other countries because it is a great opportunities for the attackers when when they are finding such type of environment vulnerable where they can get in and there and they can hide their tracks through these jumps uh, within these uh, organizations. Now from the other side, we know today the businesses are uh, related, connected to each other. So the SMEs, majority of SMEs, they have these business relationship. It could be the B2B business relationship with others. So they are part of the supply chain. So if you will not be impacted, maybe through you, you will impact others. And because of that, we start seeing even the practice uh, in big firms and big companies that they are dealing with the third parties, especially the SMEs. Mm -hmm. They start building programs, uh, a compliance programs for certain controls for those SMEs that is dealing with them in B2B middle to comply with that, with the minimum security requirement because they don't want to be impacted of their weaknesses and through them to their main business. And this program starts, we, we are seeing this kind of trend is, is going in the market. So, uh, so that is the fact, yeah. and that is an, a reality. If it's not happening, it will happen. Or it's happening and you don't know about that. And that is a fact. Now, the role of uh, the MSSPs, maybe it has been mentioned uh, by Jad in different areas, but when we are talking about the challenges that they are facing, which is related to the resources and especially financial, and also to the skills. So the MSSVs, their commitment, they will deliver the services and capabilities to these companies to achieve a good level of security. Keep in mind uh, the competitiveness of the cost or the cost saving that could come from that because we know how high is mm -hmm. the total cost of ownership when they will try to build their own uh, or the, by themselves. And the other side, the skills. We know there is a huge uh, uh, gap when it will come filling the gaps uh, of uh, the shortage in cybersecurity skills. So through the MSSPs, you will find the highly capable skills that they can deliver the services. And on top of that, the great value that they are adding, because normally the MSSPs, they see majority of the market, and they see majority of the environments, and they have a great threat intelligence feeds where they can proactively protect and enable and support these SMEs to, uh, to run their business. Uh, again, the cybersecurity by itself, it has the nature of uh, the challenge of the operation and management, okay? But when you will have such type of partner to deliver to you, so you will focus on the innovation of your business and leave uh, such type of work to the specialized people who can deliver uh, the objective and outcomes to run your business smoothly and, and resiliently. Thank you for your input. Mr. Haider, as companies digitize businesses and automate operations, cyber risks increase. Remote work faces another major obstacle, which is cybersecurity threats. Organizations must incorporate policies that address cybersecurity threats when employees are working remotely. For example, some companies have adopted the use of VPN, and we'd like to learn more about that from you. Uh, how can cybersecurity support a secure digital strategy for the organization? Yeah, thank you for the question, Omar. Um, <clears throat> I think first thing we need to understand is work is no longer a place. It's an activity. Right? So what, what we're trying to see and what the pandemic has taught us is that employees generally prefer a hybrid work environment, meaning they prefer to work essentially from anywhere, not necessarily even their homes. They're at coffee shops and other places as well. Uh, in fact, I think it was Gartner who ran the study where they looked at almost 75% of employees coming back and saying that they want and will continue to be working in that hybrid environment. Yeah. So what do we do about that? 
when the pandemic hit back in 2020, uh, you know, I was having a lot of conversations with CIOs and CISOs uh, from many of our organizations around this region um, that were telling us that they want to use VPN. They had only prepared to have roughly about 15 to 20% of their employees pre-pandemic to connect via VPN, virtual private networking connections. That changed to having more than 95% of employees essentially connected. So what does that do? That creates a bottleneck. All that data funneled back into your data center, into your headquarters, and that created lots of challenges from licensing to bandwidth to all sorts of other issues. And so what we clearly learned was that model didn't work. Mm -hmm. So then organizations started moving their data center applications to the cloud. They said, okay, now let's have these employees have direct access to the cloud. And so they started using tools, and tools like cloud access security brokers, right, which essentially allow you to uh, connect different SaaS-based applications. The challenge there is they don't support all the applications, so employees want to use different, their own customized apps or various versions, and so you don't have that support. And then they also start using secure web gateways, which allows you to then authenticate the person and then give them access to that particular instance. But again, like a VPN, the challenge there is it allows you access once, and then it forgets about you. So you can essentially continue to do whatever you want in that environment. So what we've seen over the course of the last two and a half, three years now, is sort of this emergence where you are dealing with four fundamental challenges you know, in this hybrid mm -hmm. work world. Yeah. The first is the principle of least privilege. People have access, then they continue to have access, and they can have access to anything. You deal with the challenge of limited number of applications that you're supporting, and then you deal with the fact that your data is not necessarily uh, you know, uh, inspected all the time, right? And so that becomes a, a big issue. What the industry is doing and what something we are doing as an organization, and of course I'm sure others are, are as well, is kind of this model that, again, Gartner calls Secure Access Service Edge, SASE for short. And this model essentially merges the best of two worlds, network as a service and security as a mm -hmm. service. Mm -hmm. So you have the best of quality of service and WAN optimization and all these other things, and on the other side you've got best of security with the CASB, secure web gateways, firewalls, and all these things. So that merger, I think, is ultimately what organizations need to look at. The SASE model, which we also call ZTNA 2.0, because 1.0 was those early days. I think that model is essentially what's going to help organizations launch new digital services and being able to connect everything to anything, right, and to okay. everywhere. That's ultimately where I think I see that future going, and that's something that many organizations are focused on right now. Great, thank you so much. Sheikh Salman. Cybercrime is becoming more common as the world becomes more digitized. Unfortunately, government entities and large companies remain the biggest threats for cyber attacks for the huge amount of data that they hold and also the potential financial gains these hackers will get if the attacks were successful. What are the top cybersecurity threats these entities are facing and what is NCSC doing to protect private and public sectors in Bahrain as we transition into a digital economy? I think. Um the, the, the attacks that we've seen are all similar, as I have already mentioned. Ransomware is top yeah. of the list, uh, followed by spear phishing um, and phishing in general. These are the actual risks, and they're repetitive. And the reason they're there is because there are massive vulnerabilities mm -hmm. in the network. The company, uh, these um, attackers take advantage of this. So yeah. what is the government going to do? I think the government, as I mentioned earlier, needs to come up with standards. But standards need to be followed, and there's massive investment from large enterprises, yep. as well as SMEs. And I think uh, this is where uh, the role of government can come in, is to enable the private sector to serve, um, through managed service mm -hmm. providers, those entities. And I think it's not logical for an entity to say, I have five employees on one shift, protecting the enterprise. Banking is running 24 by seven. Your infrastructure is on 24 by seven. So you're looking at monitoring your environment 24 by seven, and that requires you to have five times four shifts. So that is a massive cost investment. Added to that software, the salaries that you end up paying Absolutely. is gonna be a massive burden to, as a cost center to any entity. So a more cost-effective method will be to go through an MSSP. But the cost of employees right now is very high. The whole world now, the catchphrase is cybersecurity. Yeah. So 
every employee that knows cybersecurity is extremely happy. The only people who are not happy is us managers trying to keep them in place. And I think retention is going to be difficult. Paying them is going to be high. And I think what the government can do, and we have two of the most important elements here in the room with us, Tim Keen and the labor market reform, is to work together with companies, MSSPs, is to build local capabilities. Tim Keen has just launched a program in the Kingdom of Bahrain that builds up skills. And that, together with uh, LMRA, can as well force the MSSPs to bring in local skills. Now, once you start building up local skills, you're no longer competing yeah. with the global market for competency. And I think that's the role that we can play. We are now working together in unison to build up the skill sets. It's not an overnight exercise. Absolutely. It takes a long time. And so that resolved one side of it. And technology investment is the next front. And I think um, how do we help small companies come up and invest in cybersecurity and provide cybersecurity skills and tools? And that is a work in progress. But I think right now, the most important thing is to build up the skill set and to enable companies to have their own people, but as well have MSSPs serving the local market with the right skills, and I think that's what we need to all work together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Before we proceed uh, for the third session, we can take one question as well. Anyone? Yes, please. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, question for uh, NCSC. Uh, there, so the earlier point was often the large institutions are the targets, whether <clears throat> whether that's the banks or the, the major companies. When an institution is under attack, uh, they're struggling to find out what's going on, what's the exposure, how are they gonna respond. However, the other players in the market could benefit greatly if they knew what attacks were taking place in the, in the market. So I'll give you, as a bank, when one of our, if we're under attack, if we could share information to the other banks, whether they go on higher alert or whether they start to monitor more aggressively, in a timely fashion, that would be of great benefit. So do you see a, a way where NCSC plays a role for timely sharing of information? So thank you for your question. Thank you. It's a great question, actually. Um, so there are two parts to that answer. The first part is, what are we doing now? And right now, um, through our website, people register to receive timely information of certain incidents and risks that we will notify the, the kingdom. So all your IT team are now part of, if they haven't, registered to it, and they will receive timely bulletins. So the second part of your question is, you know, not every attack is valid for a banking sector or for a certain entity. Is, is it relevant, relevant to us? So what we've now worked on and have released, a classification of an incident. So if an incident does happen, then that is classified, and then your team will be able to receive that. Now, the third part of it is now what we're doing is going to have a um, sectoral specific incident response team. And so not only they will liaison with your team and to coordinate with, say, the banking sector and the CBB, um, but also work on specific incident response with specifically the banking sector. Because you need sectoral speciality, whether it's OT, IOT, or core banking. That is in itself unique, and I think that needs to be addressed in a specific teams. And so what you're gonna see right now, we're gonna have um, working with an incident response team dedicated to the healthcare sector. Next, now we're working with the banking sector to come up with the regulations. And with that regulations will come specific team that is dedicated to that, to incident respond, communicate, and liaison with you. So yeah, it is a work in progress. There is an, um, an interim solution, uh, just temporarily, to make sure that communication continues, but there will be more a specific sectoral communication with each sector. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. We're happy to be involved in some of that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. In our third session, we're going to talk about how to overcome supply chain challenges by moving security online. My first question is to Mr. Fahed. Previously, companies had to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in hardware cybersecurity products and the increased demand of cybersecurity uh, led to delays in installation. Sometimes you have to wait a few months or even a year to install your, your hardware cybersecurity. 
Cloud cybersecurity, on the other hand, offers the same level of security with less budget and faster delivery time. Could you please elaborate more on the benefits of cloud security versus hardware security? Okay, um, thank you very much for the question. And uh, now if we will look to, to the market, this is where things is, is going, uh, especially from an uh, economic point of view. Um, there is a trend in the market, you know, to have the spending uh, instead of uh, uh, OPEX investment uh, to be, uh, sorry, I mean, of, from CAPEX investment mm -hmm. to, uh, to an uh, OPEX investment. And that is applied in different uh, areas in, in the economy. Now, one of, one of it, which is related to, to the cybersecurity. Again, it's back to the point. Now, when you are thinking about building such type of capabilities in-house, so you need to bring your solution to put it in-house. Um, normally, uh, the, the organization, they fail in uh, uh, accounting for the real cost that they are uh, 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 counting out of, out of uh, um, this kind of investment, which is the, the CAPEX investment. It is not just the direct investment that they are, they are facing. It's not the price of or the cost of the solution, the hardware or the appliance that they are getting. They have the logistics behind that. They have the operation. They have the management. Mm -hmm. All of that is counting part of the cost that they are incurring. On top of that, the challenge that they are facing it from the shortage of yeah. the, the skills and capabilities. Now, and of course, when you are, or organization is thinking about investing a huge amount of, let's say, investment, to build such type of capabilities, they are looking out of the return, out of that, especially in the cybersecurity domain. So we are talking about the protection and safety and so on, and safe environment for innovative uh, uh, business. Now, what, what the trend is, where the trend is going, is to start providing these capabilities over the cloud as a services. So what does that mean for you? It will mean for you more cost saving. This is one thing. This is one side of it. So the total cost of ownership is less. Now, from the other side, when you are looking for the risk and risk assessments, so you have another partner who is sharing the risks uh, with you. So you have a, a capable partner who will provide you with these services, especially when these services is provided as a service and on top of it as an immense service, because you will reach to that yeah. level of uh, um, of capabilities that is supporting you uh, from a business point of view. And from feature, uh, feature sets point of view, from improvement, from all of that, and the headache of operation and management, you will find someone who is taking care of it, and you will, from your side, you will just focus on your business. Now, comparing to the results, as be what we are seeing in the markets, the results and the outcome that you are getting out of these services that is offered to you over the cloud is better than uh, the, uh, uh, the on-premise solution that, uh, that you are getting. Why? Because always this solution is up to date and we know the cybersecurity is not something that it can happen in point of time, it's just in a continuous thing. And you, when you will find the provider who is providing you with these capabilities with a certain level of agreement, SLAs, so you will be in a safe, and you have a, a confidence of the provided solution for you. Overall, this solution is providing values to the business and to the customers themselves, more than you know, just building uh, your own uh, uh, solutions that it come with, it, with a lot of challenges that you will face with. Thank you so much. Mr. Haidar. Firewall security is paramount for any network deployment. Many enterprises are choosing Palo Alto, net, Palo Alto firewalls as their firewall platform. Virtual next generation firewall provide all the capabilities of our physical next generation firewall in a virtual machine. As the leader in the Gartner Magic Quadrant for network firewalls for the 10th time, how can Palo Alto encourage organizations to move to virtual firewalls? It's a good question. Uh, Thank you. So uh, you're right, I mean, we, we've enjoyed a good success with the next gen firewall. This is generally how the company was founded about 14 years ago. Um, we, of course, do a lot more than firewalls today. We spend uh, you know, a lot of time supporting customers in the cloud journey, in the SOC journey, in other areas as well. 
But specific to your question, um, I, I don't know if we need to encourage organizations. I think they see the value, as Fahad has eloquently just mentioned, you know, there, there are true cost savings as you move to the cloud. Mm -hmm. And the same is true of um, security services as well. So as you look at an action firewall, if it offers the same functionality as a hardware-based firewall, then why wouldn't you do it in the cloud? And as you transition to the cloud, it's not just about the data you, you're protecting moving to the cloud, it's also the data that's in the cloud it's, itself. So organizations use obviously not one, not 10, but tens of thousands of workloads that need protection yeah. based on different segments. And so a next-gen firewall offers those capabilities. Now the real advantage, I, I guess, if you want to differentiate with, with us, and the reason why we're still leading is, is because we continue to make it a next generation firewall. I mean, I used to joke about this, that you know, we're next generation for the last 14 years, right? <laughs> um, but the way we are next generation is we continue to offer more and more services and we help organizations consolidate those tools that I talked about previously. You know, your CASB, your Secure Web Gateway, your DLP, your DNS, all of these are now consolidated in that next gen virtual firewall. Again, hardware or software, it doesn't make a difference. And so they're seeing that advantage. I think this is one of the, 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 the big things. So I don't, as I said, I don't, I don't see us really encouraging them. I, I, I see us really supporting them and really helping Thank them you. consolidate the tools. Perfect. Thank you so much. Mr. Jad, as enterprises scale up their use of public cloud, they must rethink of how they should protect their data and applications while adopting a cloud-centric security model. What should a, how should a company strategize its secure transformation to the public cloud? Um, you know, it was mentioned, uh, uh, cloud is very attractive for many reasons, you know, TCO, scalability, but mm -hmm. also uh, security. Uh, and I think this is, uh, in my personal point of view, a, a bit underestimated or under, undermined. Uh, what's important is for organizations to think through security and embed security or cyber security really in their cloud journey, in their cloud transformation journey. So not have it as an afterthought, but really have it embedded from the beginning as you go through planning, design, implementation, and eventually operation. Think through security or cyber security throughout. Have proper capabilities, you know, cyber architects uh, involved early on, again, not as an afterthought. The beauty, again, of, uh, of you know, uh, these public cloud providers, particularly the, the usual suspects, the hyperscalers, Microsoft, Google, AWS, uh, Alibaba, and what have you, is they invest significantly in security, right? They've, they've been investing a lot. It's uh, typically, you know, uh, uh, a point of differentiation. So when you look at how they pitch their solutions, they also pitch security and privacy as, as part of their uh, you know, story. Uh, now, in any large transformation, cloud transformation, there's always a hybrid environment. There's always stuff that will reside on-prem, uh, you know, customized solutions or customized uh, platforms that would continue to be hosted, you know, with, with the, with the, within the organization or maintained by the organization. Hence the importance of, again, thinking through cloud integration and having cybersecurity throughout the journey and not, you know, as an afterthought. Uh, and now you see a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, large systems integrators focusing on cloud integration alongside security integration to, again, as a means to differentiate. So they come and tell you we can do AWS integration or AWS migration with proper security measures to make sure that your cloud solution is properly thought of, not just from a performance and cost, but from a security point of view. This is the third leg, I would say, of the cloud transformation. You know, typically or early on, people used to think of cloud as a means to save cost. Mm -hmm. Again, TCO is reason number one to move to cloud. Then scalability, right? I can increase uh, my, my load or my customer base without having to invest more. Security is also a very important factor to migrate to cloud if done properly. Thank you so much. Sheikh Salman. NCSC's directives have, have made cybersecurity a top priority for Bahrain's government critical infrastructure. It is challenging to develop and execute a national cybersecurity strategy. Could you please walk us through your journey from the development of the strategy to the execution? What are the major challenges when it comes to building a national critical infrastructure? 
So building a strategy is as a typical standard. You need to look at your risk, mm -hmm. and then you look at how you mitigate that risk through the strategy, and then you initiate initiatives that will resolve that strategy. Now, the difficulty here is you're talking about establishing or putting in a strategy for the kingdom. And that yeah. is such a big scale that you Absolutely. cannot sit with every single company and, and, and sit with them looking and, and address their, analyze the risks, and putting individually the, you know, ways to resolve for that risk. So in order to quickly expedite this, and since this is the first version of our strategy that needs to be covered in four years, we took a segment of each sector and sat with them individually and looked at the commonality. <clears throat> So in cybersecurity, there is this concept of 80-20, where you look at there are 20 things that I must do to protect myself. Now, you do not need to execute every tw all 20 to be secure. You just need to focus on the five of the 20, and that will ex take you up to 80%. Yeah. So our focus in the first version is to put in the right standards, um, the right procedures, and the right awareness program to elevate and try to resolve the problems that we see on the ground. So that a lot of our panelists have mentioned awareness, and awareness at the individual, the student, the parent, and the employee. That is a program by itself. You need to put in the right standards, and that is a national standard, and then later on, the sectoral standards yeah. that are you know, going to be um, implemented by the regulators such, for example, as the CBB that will sit there and have a new version that will be working with them to build up the next version of the um, standard. And they themselves will then oversee it and ensure that their sector implements it, not us. And secondly is to improve our uh, capabilities, whether it is the competencies that we need to train. Now that is enough because if we look at the landscape, especially the private sector, and I mean the private sector, yeah. they are not following a lot of the basic principles. Uh, it is not as hygienic mm. as a term uh, as the government center. The government center has been always security aware. Now there is obviously a lot more we can do. So, do you, so as building up that strategy, we are putting in, as I mentioned, top five out of 20, based on our discussions with our partners in, uh, in this lan landscape suite that we've done. And then after the four years, the standards have been put in place that in itself will go back to feed us with the risk assessment for the next version. And this way we will have this continuous four-year engine that will look at the sector, review with the sector, and read from the sector what has worked from the strategy and what has not worked. Mm -hmm. And we'll adjust and as we go. We'll adjust. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. We can now take another question from the audience before we proceed to the fourth session. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Yusuf Al Fadl from Central Bank of Bahrain. Actually, I don't have a question, uh, but since uh, you, know, you, you have talked uh, so many about CBB and the threat on the financial uh, sector. Uh, in the financial sectors, we are facing two types of threats. One, cyber security. The other one is fraud. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. uh, in cyber security, we have uh, put uh, yani, a very strong regulations for banks. Uh, and we are working hand on hand with the national security to develop the financial cert. Uh, my question to the person, I don't know from which bank, who said there is no sharing information. We do have a group uh, of all uh, security at banks, and we do share information. And we are working on a, a system to share information between banks if there is any cyber threats. Uh, coming to fraud, uh, banks, they have very strong system also benefit. Uh, I haven't experienced any single uh, fraud because of the uh, security loopholes on, on the bank's application. Thank you. Okay. 
it's all because of uh, individuals who give yeah. their credential to the uh, to the fraudsters and we have we have been working uh, a lot with uh, with bob with banks uh, and uh, to to educate these uh, individuals and uh, bob working also in a big campaign uh, with the tra with the ministry of interior uh, to educate uh, individuals on how to protect their uh, credential uh, so they will not be uh, like a target to fraud. That's amazing. Thank you so much for the valuable input. Does anyone have any? Yes, please. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, Sheikh Salwan, I'm a big fan of you because of the NCSC setup you have done. It has protected our company to a very big and large scale. So thank you very much to your entire team. Please convey my regards to them. Second, my question is, the entry point is always a risk for any cybersecurity. And our entry point to the country are the telecom providers, right? It's STCs, federal codes, mm -hmm. there's other. Now, in this entire discussion, I did not hear any kind of a comparison that what STC is doing more secure, more better than the other service providers. And what you're only hearing is mostly is basically how they want to sell the services. But I think we also want to know what the service providers are doing for us to keep us more secure, keep our country, keep our business, keep our economy more secure. So we as business take the right decision to work with the right partner. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we actually have a session about the role of telecom uh, providers in uh, cybersecurity, but uh, Mr. Fahad, can you please uh, elaborate on this topic? Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, now, uh, do we have a role in that? Uh, absolutely. Now, uh, uh, when we are talking about STC at large and STC in Bahrain, that is what we are uh, working on. We started working on before, and this is what we are bringing to. Uh, to the market really uh, as an, a leader uh, and uh, digital enabler. Part of our portfolio is now the cybersecurity. Within the synergy of the group itself, already SCC has established a company that is, uh, that is focusing just in the cybersecurity, which is Serar by SCC. And we have a great uh, collaboration and partnership with um, SCC Al Bahrain to offer these capabilities and services on top of what they are offering today and also the very high promising, I would say, the future and roadmap that we have it and that is coming. It's not in, in the long term, but in the short term that it will come to, to the market. Because we know that we have the capability as a uh, telco provider, and we are not anymore telco provider. We are on a player, a digital player that is offering these uh, uh, top of notch uh, services. Maybe we have mentioned of uh, some of the services uh, that uh, already we start offering it to overcome these challenges because we have an, a great understanding locally, regionally, and globally for what's required and the, the threat landscape and so on. So we are building this uh, capability to offer it to build and uh, secure and uh, uh, enable the businesses uh, in the countries. Uh, just one thing that uh, uh, related to the point that, that you have mentioned. It. Now, uh, this is very important. When you are getting uh, an, uh, uh, the exposure to to the, the external world uh, through the providers. That is the internet. It is just an vibe that you are getting it. And there is a, a responsibility, of course, in each and every one to make sure that these uh, gates is, is protected. Uh, from our side, from uh, 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 specifically if I'm talking about SCC side, there is an uh, added value services on top of this connectivity that can be provided. And also there is other areas that also you need to look to uh, from your side, because it is, it should, it should be the whole ecosystem is is complementing each other. So the provider that they will provide you with any capabilities top of notch, and also from uh, from the organization side, they need to look to uh, other areas. For example, the strategy, the governance, the policies, the procedure, and so on. All of this, we can call it, you know, uh, a secure programs or uh, a strategy for for the organization. Thank you. Just to quickly just give you another, on top of what uh, my colleague Fad has, has mentioned. Um, so we've seen the banking sector being attacked by denial of service 
and that is a service that is provided by the telcos. But also we're working with the telcos as well to, um, if we get threat intelligence that a certain public IP from a private sector company is gonna be attacked and there is a window for us to help protect them, then we are working with them to quickly get that information um, immediately. What we're working on is making that time between identifying the actual name of the, cu of the customer. So if we say IP123 is customer X, then we have the contact information. We're able to communicate with, with them as fast as possible to tell them, listen, we've seen something. Um, we need you to take action. Um, so telcos now, uh, we're working with the TRA to look at opportunities to make um, denial of service services available in all telcos and ensure that they are effective because a lot of uh, denial of services are a name good and there, but is it really truly effective? Mm -hmm. And that's the role that we're gonna play with the TRA to ensure that we've gone through the right procedures to validate that service. So you will see in the next period the service assurance of service providers, whether it's telecommunication and um, cybersecurity services. Thank you, Sheikh Salman. In our uh, fourth session, we are going to discuss how to balance organizational risk with the cost of cybersecurity and also innovative solutions such as AI, machine learning, and deep link analysis. ROI in cybersecurity is not quantifiable. Therefore, justifying the budget spent on cybersecurity might be hard sometimes. This is why cybersecurity professionals propose a new way of calculating ROI by, by actually calculating the, co the cost of not investing or conning. In this session, we're going to discuss how CISOs and CIOs can evaluate a cybersecurity budget and how we can utilize technologies such as AI to detect a cybersecurity attack before it happens. Mr. Fahd, preventing a cyber attack is more cost effective than reacting to one. Why aren't more businesses investing in proactive cybersecurity programs? And what is your advice when it comes to proactive measurements? Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you can allow me to say it in Arabic. Uh, so uh, proactively being proactively, that is what could support your business. Um, uh, and also, it could direct really the right investment in the right place. Um, through our experience, um, we were being engaged. This is just an example. We have been engaged with, what, with one of the customer in our, uh, in our uh, area. The customer has spent millions to build controls in his environment. And then we get engaged to do an assessment after that. It wasn't a good step forward for him to do that, to do that assessment to, to see where they have reached with, uh, with their investments. And uh, with the time, the management, they have changed, and then they get back to us, and they were looking to see what is the value that uh, the assessment will add to them. And their decision at that time was saying, it will not add much of value, already we have spent a huge investments to build in a secure environment. We told them, do not stop it now. Give us like a few days. One of the exercises that we are doing is the fishing. We will do it, and then we will, we will say bye. And we have done that, that fishing. After a week, we came back to them, and with the guy who was the decision maker, we presented to him and his team. We told him that we were able, we have uh, um, created an efficient campaign. And we, we told him that we, we, we got some finding in there uh, that we would like to share it with you. This is the result of the last task that we will do with you. And there was a lot of uh, other uh, assessments that we were planning to do, but uh, the decision was to stop it. Now, when we started presenting, we told him that we get some credentials for the employees of the company. And some of them, they are from the executives. He said maybe these are fakes or whatever. When, when we present to him the inbox of some of his employees and executives, the language has flipped 180 degree. Absolutely. So why, why is that? Because, you know, when you work proactively, 
you will identify the weaknesses that you have, do the right assessment, you will identify the weaknesses, then you can build your own strategy and the roadmap to, to do the right investment in the most efficient way that can support your business uh, going forward. So that is very important and always we are hearing it that the organization is spending here and there and they, they get an incident or they, they get in a bad situation because you know the way that they are, uh, they are handling it. This is good for the organization that they are working, they are investing. And some of the organization that they are not looked to this domain, as, as I mentioned, you know, and, and some of, uh, uh, you know, uh, for the SME uh, sector uh, specifically. In in US, last year, they, they reported that 50% um, of the SMEs that has been attacked, uh, they were out of business after six months. That is a big lose for them because they were not looking to the cybersecurity as an enabler for them and for their businesses. They, there, were, they, there was no proactive approach for that. And always we are seeing it that organization is learning the, the lesson by the hard way. We don't want that to happen to the market because if it happened, things it will go in, in, in south, we'd Absolutely. say. So yeah. proactively, it will, it will make it, I would say, uh, a safe uh, uh, journey for the organization and for the business itself. Thank you so much. Sheikh Salman. In order to leverage the benefits of AI within a technology stack, a solid foundation of enforced data governance and availability of upskilled personnel are needed within the organization. What is NCSC's NCSC strategy to adopt cyber AI uh, to protect governmental operations? So if you look at uh, any of the documentation of all, any product, AI is on the first paragraph. So everybody's taking that magic word and putting it Everywhere. front and center. The difference is, yes, there are companies that have delivered products. The only advice I can tell my colleagues is before you invest and be sold on the idea is to try it out. Try it mm. out by using real data, real live examples, and we've seen a massive difference between capability of products that have AI embedded in it and without it, and by actually trying it. So it's a very good statement, try before you buy, and don't believe the salesman. This has been universal for a long time, and everybody says, I have AI. It's yeah. just, it varies between company to company. Great, thank you so much. Sirjad? AI and machine learning are becoming essential to cybersecurity. As these technologies are capable of analyzing millions of data sets and tracking down a wide variety of cyber threats. What is your opinion about integrating AI in cybersecurity defense? And should companies start adopting AI technology? Could you elaborate, could you elaborate on the different levels of cybersecurity and the importance of detecting a threat before it happens? Yes, uh, so look, again, back, back to the point, AI is, is probably being uh, abused uh, uh, today, but uh, in cybersecurity in particular, and this is not something new, you, you have an abundance of data being collected, right, through endpoints, devices, yeah. applications, and what have you. What uh, AI and analytics in general enable you to do is, is two things. One, it allows you to uh, analyze a huge amount of data and detect abnormalities, certain patterns that could potentially be uh, a, a cyber threat. The other thing is it allows you, if proven to be correct, and, and this is a threat, AI or, or machine learning or, or analytics uh, or automation, you could label it uh, whatever you want, um, allows you to trigger a certain response. Uh, we mentioned you know, that uh, there's scarcity of resources when it comes to cybersecurity, human capital, people. And what AI, the beauty of AI is it automates a lot of the mundane tasks that typically you would need people to do through a machine, through an algorithm. And uh, you know, this allows you to at least address part of the more or, or part of the less sophisticated uh, threats that could be triggered. Now in terms of the levels of, of uh, cybersecurity, uh, you know, we spoke that in the past many 
companies used to be passive, right? Uh, they didn't do much in terms of uh, compliance to certain uh, uh, regulation, and over time, they started to evolve uh, to being reactive, so they are aware of what cybersecurity, when they get uh, a certain attack, they respond to it, they you know, bring in uh, an advisor, they bring in a security specialist to, uh, to check their systems and to rectify the issue. Today, the trend is be proactive. Back again to what uh, Fahad uh, mentioned, proactivity allows you to, again, analyze behavior through data, so the data that you're collecting is also behavioral data. And I had mentioned early on that a big part of the threat comes from user error or behavioral issues. Uh, so predictive cybersecurity or predictive analytics allows you to detect early on changes in patterns, changes in behaviors, and really respond in a more timely manner to the incident before it even happens. And what it also allows you, again, is to trigger a chain of commands that allow you to inform other entities back, back to the question. You know, all of this can be automated. So you witness an incident in a certain bank, it follows a certain pattern, it's industry specific, you, you, know, you, you block it or you address it, you notify other banks, you trigger a chain of commands that will hopefully you know, uh, uh, protect other, uh, other companies or other organizations from facing this. So this is AI, it's just a, a more sophisticated way of using algorithms, automation, through the abundance availability of data. Thank you for your input. Mr. Haidar, I know you're gonna like this question. Let's talk about ROI and cybersecurity. Cyber risk is one of the many risks organizations face, and cybersecurity is just another capex or opex when it comes to budgeting. Moreover, cybersecurity appears to be expensive. And it's difficult to know whether the money spent uh, on cybersecurity will, 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 be, will return uh, ROI. How can a CIO or CISO provide the cyber, uh, justify the cybersecurity budget to CFOs and CEOs? So it is an interesting question. Um, I, I think we need to look at it slightly more differently, in my opinion. I think if you're having discussions as a CISO or a CIO around ROI and total cost of ownership with a CEO or a CFO, I frankly feel that that's the wrong discussion to have. Um, the reason why I say this is because uh, generally, uh, I mean, again, if you, if you take a step back and you think about where we're coming from from the last couple of years, yes, the pandemic turned a lot of CIOs and CISOs into heroes, right, for their organizations because we provided Absolutely. the connectivity. Everyone, you know, in the business essentially kept running thanks to the efforts of the, um, of the network and security teams. Um, but now the business is asking what's next, right? And that's ultimately the answer we need to have as CISOs and CIOs. So uh, I, I think the, my approach to this is slightly different. Um, you know, I, I, I think we invest and we do a great job of marketing and, and kind of uh, investing in tools and capabilities. But then when we try and go and convince a CIO, uh, sorry, a CEO or a CFO around the tools or capabilities, we gen they generally tend to get a little bit lost. And so I think the focus really needs to shift towards value and towards risk and protection. So just because a tool or a capability exists doesn't mean that it provides the right level of protection. And so if I were to use this as an example, um, let's take, I won't use phishing because I think we've used it enough, I think let's use patching. So as an organization, um, as a CISO, let's say you go to the CEO and CFO, and uh, the question you ask is, how much security do you want? You know, uh, do you want zero days in terms of patching? Do you, are you willing to take 10 days, 15 days, one month before we can fully patch the systems, right? Um, and we know patching is a critical thing because if we don't patch, then it opens up our organization to vulnerabilities, which could obviously lead into threats mm -hmm. and of course attacks. So the CEO's response generally is, I want zero days. I want it patched immediately. Well, that's gonna cost, let's say $10 million. But if you're willing to extend this to five days, perhaps it'll cost $5 million. Or if it's two weeks, it's gonna be a million dollars. So that's, the, that's where you start with the conversation. Now, obviously, they may come back and say, all right, we agree, let's do a million dollars, two weeks, that's how much time you have in order to patch. What you've just done is created a protection level agreement with the business. So what you've done is versus talking about here's the tool, here's the capability, here's the resources we need, you're talking about here's the protection that we can guarantee over the course of the two weeks that we will patch you know, once those, uh, within those two weeks uh, the systems. Now, if you get breached, 
God forbid, and you get breached within those two weeks period that the business has accepted as a risk, as His Excellency said earlier, then that's something that is acceptable and that's a business decision. If it's beyond the two weeks, then of course that's a problem, right? And that's something that needs to be addressed. And of course you adapt and everything else. So where I'm going with this is you, what you really need to do is you need to have these protection level agreements on various topics. We talked about phishing, we talked about incident response, we talked about a lot of other kind of critical topics. And as CISOs, what we need to do is offer the business choices, right? Versus saying, here's the ROI and here's what I think. I, you know, those are important conversations, but if you can show them value and risk and the, the, the amount of protection that changes as a result of the investment, then you start treating cybersecurity as a business investment, not as an add-on cost. Thank you so much. Great. Um, we'd like to take one question as well. Do you have any question for our speakers? All right. So as, yes, please, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Major Muhammad Labdarla. Uh, financial investigation department. Uh, I would like to thank uh, STC company for uh, having this panel and for uh, sharing experience. Uh, my question for Mr. Fahad. Uh, these days we are facing uh, a lot of uh, fraud uh, cases. So through your experience, uh, by communication between the telecommunication companies and the banks, we find a, a big gap when we want to refund the money which you transfer from banks to telecommunication companies or to cryptocurrency platforms. So have you seen any tools that will bring the money as fast as it can? Because this kind of crimes, it happens within a few seconds or a few minutes. So have you seen any uh, countries have used the blockchain technology or any kind of technology that can reverse the amount as fast as it can? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for the question. Um, maybe uh, more expert is available in, in the room who can help with, uh, with the answer to this question. Now, uh, uh, to the point where uh, we start hearing about the fraud, we know with the expansion and the digitization, these kind of threats and risks start raising. And that is the race between the good and bad. Okay, we know these are digitizing our life for the best of our life. And at the same time, it's an, a great opportunity with the readiness, you know, to overcome these gaps and challenges that they are facing. Now, is there any trends in the market to overcome these challenges technology-wise and so on? Yes, there is a heavy work in there. Uh, maybe it's still it's not to the ultimate level that we are looking for, but it is. There is now initiatives, as you mentioned, the blockchain start to be adopted in certain areas, but it, will, uh, it could uh, take uh, so some time uh, for that, but um, again, and for the time being, when, when we are looking to these um, uh, kind of fraud based on our experience that we are seeing, it goes back again, majority to it, to the behavior of the users themselves. Okay, their behavior, um, where the things is going is very promising, but for, for the time being, the, in term, I would say, uh, building capabilities and that is more to uh, uh, build an awareness, and that is the collaboration that should be done between the different entities uh, 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 who is part of the whole ecosystems. So I think this is, uh, this is what, I can, uh, what I can answer. I hope that I have, you know, uh, I would say yes, that is the solution for that, but is the journey for the whole world is, is to overcome such type of challenges. As what happened in, in the cybersecurity. When it yeah. started, it was a fact for the people and we start seeing a major thing. Now, when we are talking about the fraud, also it's the same thing. It's a digital transformation, and this is what is, what is coming with, uh, with it. Thank you for the valuable input. <coughs> As we come to the end of our session, I'd like to invite again the CEO of STC Bahrain, Mr. Nizar Benabila. I think what we witnessed today is a great, great discussion, and uh, I would uh, copy what my colleague Fahad, he started by answering the first question. Yes, we are coming to something very, very sensitive. Everybody is really worried about, everybody conscious about it. And the importance of 
what we are facing. But to be honest, with the great discussion that we saw from our panelists, honestly, and with you as our guest, it's really, really amazing to see this kind of collaboration that we see in the country of Bahrain between the decision makers and the service providers and also the users to come over this challenge. Of course, allow me to thank all of our panelists for their time and definitely big thanks to all of you for being with us here in STC, the first, alhamdulillah, uh, TikTok, and hopefully, inshallah, we'll pick and choose more of an interesting subjects that we definitely will be our honor to have you, inshallah, with us more and more in the future. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank Highly you. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.